wish to be notified about future proceedings on a particular case, please provide your contact information to the Planning Department. The Planning Commission and the Board are interested in hearing the views of all persons who wish to express themselves on all the agenda items. However, we ask that all speakers please be as courteous and concise as possible and avoid long repetitions of facts or opinions which have already been stated. For your information, the Wichita City Council has adopted a policy for all city zoning items. A copy of this policy is available from the planning staff. The City Council relies on a written record of the Planning Commission hearings and does not conduct its own additional public hearings on these items. The decision of the BZA is final. Any appeal of a decision of the BZA is to the District Court. Thank you. I have one additional open opening comment about our agenda today. Uh, this is particularly for people who are participating by public comments. If you were planning to speak on item 4.1, agenda item 4.1, which is a zoning case in the county located near North Ridge Road and West 45th Street North, uh, this is a proposed vehicle just yesterday, the applicant wanted to defer, asked to defer the case to October 12th. Staff did their best to notify people who were interested in the case of the cancellation. Um, we just want to make sure you recognize we will not address that item 4.1 today. We're moving it to October 12th, so you'd be free to go if you um, were here for that case solely. Next, I will ask for a roll call uh, call of commissioners present please yes ma'am fox here duel here mckay here bill johnson here blick josh blick absent green here nix here Foster? Here. Warren? Warren is absent. Joe Johnson? Joe Johnson? Joe Johnson is absent. Miles? Present. Hartman? Here. Aldrich? Here. Williams Bay? Here. Show 11 members present. Thank you. Our next item of business is the election of officers. Blessedly, the person in the chairman's seat can take the seat for only 12 consecutive months, and so my term is at its conclusion. Uh, it has been a great privilege to serve, and I would just like to thank my fellow commissioners for their patience with my quirks and inability to do math in my head. Uh, you've been most patient. Uh, I would like now to move Mr. Bob Duell be elected as chairman of this fine body. Second. Second. We have 17 seconds. That must mean it's a unanimous vote, but just in case. <laughs> I'm gonna give Mr. Bill Johnson the second. Uh, however, thank you for the chorus of approval. And now I would ask all in favor of the motion to indicate by second. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I knew there would not be. Uh, you're, you are all in excellent hands. Mr. Duell is a man of the finest character and uh, the greatest intellect um, and a good and dear friend from our work together. Uh, please, let's change seats, Mr. Duell. And I was going to sing, Oh, Happy Day, but I'll, I'll save you or spare you from that. And Joe Johnson has arrived. Let me take a moment to just uh, thank Ann for the work that she has done this past year. Uh, her leadership's been outstanding. Uh, she's been a great asset, uh, not only to this uh, commission, but also to the community. And we thank you very much for your contributions. Been nice. 
you'll get me trained here. Um, next item is going to be the election of a, a vice chair. Um, and I would like to uh, put uh, into nomination the name of Deborah Foster to hold that position. And second. I would also like to, uh, second was who? Joe, okay, Joe, good. Uh, I'd like to mention that we will have a review of uh, an upcoming bylaw change, but not today. So we have 30 days to uh, make a point committee, but uh, Deborah has agreed to serve uh, as the vice chair and uh, I'm glad to have you. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Any other nominations? Have a motion uh, to these nominations. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, aye. 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 Okay, I would entertain a uh, motion to uh, approve uh, Deborah Foster as vice chair. So, so moved. Second. Second. Did you get that? <laughs> okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. There we go. We're going to uh, go down the list and see which cases. Oh, we got to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Thank you. Mr. So me. Well, I show is absent from that duel. Uh, Miles Hartman. So we've got a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. I abstain. So do I. And three abstains, the people that uh, I mentioned. Okay, now we'll move on to consideration of subdivision and uh, committee uh, recommendations. Uh, first case is uh, subdivision uh, 200021, uh, one step final plat for uh, Ballman Fourth Edition. Uh, located about a half mile south of uh, West Pawnee on the east side of Mays Road. Does anyone present, or anyone on the Planning Commission want to hear that case? Yes, please. Just because it was not a unanimous decision in subdivision committee. Okay, we'll hear that case. Next case is um, a one step final plat on one rise addition located on the north side of West MacArthur Road, uh, case number 00027. Is there anyone who wants to hear that case? Is there anyone present who wants to hear that case? Is there anyone on remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll take it by consent. The next case is uh, Subdivision 00035, one step final plant for RAND uh, Graphics Office Edition, located on the northeast corner of K42 and South Hoover Road. Is there anyone on the commission that would like to hear that case? Mr. Chairman, I've got to abstain from that item. Okay. Okay, uh, is there anyone uh, from the public president that president wants to hear that case? Anyone uh, on remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll take that on consent. Next case is one step final plat uh, 00036, 
uh, Cortez edition located west side of uh, South Broadway. Is there anyone on the uh, commission that wants to hear that case? Is there anyone uh, from the public that wants to hear that case? Is there anyone on remotely that wants to hear that case? If not, we'll take that on consent. The next case is subdivision 00038, one step final plat, summit lawn lane edition. We are on 00037, one step final plat, Young Edition, Young Estates Edition, uh, located along uh, the south edge, east of 47th Street South, uh, and 0.45 miles west of South Greenwich Road. Is there anyone that wants to hear this case on the commission? Anyone present from the public want to hear this case? Is there anyone uh, on remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll uh, take that case on consent. I just wanted to say that Bob didn't make these mistakes when he chaired advanced plans. <laughs> I'm learning. So now we're back on track. We're on 2.6 uh, subdivision. Uh, 00038, Summit Lawn, Lawn Lane Edition. Uh, is there one on the Planning Commission that wants to hear that case? Is there anyone present from the public that wants to hear that case? Is there anyone on remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll take that on consent. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve items 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6. 2.3 requires a separate vote. I move, I move that we approve items 2, 2, 2, 4, 2, 5, and 2, 6. Second. Okay, we've had a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion to approve item 2.3. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve item 2.3. All those in favor say aye. 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 Same time. I abstain. Mr. Chairman. Um, on the item 2.1, it's my understanding from the agent for the applicant on that one that the applicant wishes to defer that item. I don't know that they have a specified date on that one. Okay, we'll, we'll note that and we'll take that off the agenda today. Oh, excuse me, go ahead. Phil Meyer with Boffman Company, agent for the applicant. So... Um, the, the applicant on this, Jay Russell, asked me to defer this if there was going to be conversation on it because he would like to be involved in that. Planning Commission's decision, if you want to go ahead and discuss what you, whatever you want to talk about today, but bef before anybody makes any motions, I'm probably going to come back up here and ask to defer it. And you can go ahead and just defer it now if you prefer for till the next Planning Commission meeting. I make a motion we defer to the next Planning Commission. Second. Okay, Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson made the motion, second. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 We're now into vacation items. 
First vacation item is uh, 00029, vacation request in the city to vacate a portion of a sanitary easement by a separate instrument on a property zoned in PUD planned uh, unit development and located on the southwest corner of South Seneca and MacArthur Road. Anyone on the Planning Commission want to hear this? Anybody uh, present from the public want to hear this case? Do we have anybody on remotely, Scott? We do, sir. There are a number of folks who are online, but I don't see that anyone has indicated that they're interested in speaking on this okay. one. Okay, thank you. I was just going to check to see if we needed to ask that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we will then, if there's nobody who wants to hear this case, we will uh, put that on consent. 3 1. Okay, the next one is uh, vacation 00030. It's a vacation request in the city to vacate 15 foot platted utility easement on property zoned LC, limited commercial, <clears throat> generally located on the south side of. East Kellogg Drive within one half mile east of South Rock Road. Uh, is there anyone on the commission that wants to hear this case? Uh, is there anyone uh, from the uh, public that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll take that on consent. Next item is uh, vacation uh, 00031. It's a request uh, <clears throat> in the city to vacate access control to the right in and right out of movements on Town East Mall property, zoned LC, limited commercial district, generally located at Kellogg and Town East Mall Drive. Is there anyone on the commission that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone from the public that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone remotely that wants to hear this? If not, we'll take 3.3 uh, on. Next case is vacation 00032. Vacation request in the city to vacate the north 126 feet of an existing 30-foot driveway easement on property zoned uh, LC, limited commercial district, generally located north of 21st Street North and west of Pinecrest Avenue. Is there anyone on the Planning Commission that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone present from the public that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone uh, on remotely that wants to hear this case? If not, we'll take that one on consent. Move to approve items 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, and 3, 4. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by. Aye. Aye. Okay, on public hearings, the uh, first case, 4.1, has been deferred to October 12. I think an email was sent out on that. So we will uh, we'll skip that one. 4.2 is uh, a uh, CON 00036, conditional use in the city to amend a previous uh, CON 2022 0010 and expand the vehicle and equipment sales outdoor for the entire property in accordance with the revised site plan. It's generally located on the northeast corner of West uh, Central Avenue and North Hoover Road. Is there anyone on the commission that would like to hear that case? Is there anyone uh, present from the public that would like to hear that case? 
Is there anyone on remotely that would like to hear this case? If not, we'll Next, we have uh, conditional use uh, 00038, a request in the city to permit live music and entertainment defined as a nightclub in the city as an accessory use to hotels and restaurants generally located on the northeast corner of North Webb Road and Waterfront Parkway. Um, is there anyone on the Planning Commission who would like to hear this case? Is there anyone from the public uh, that would like to hear this case is present? Is there anyone remotely that would like to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we'll hear this case. Next item is a conditional use request number 00039 uh, in the city for an accessory apartment <clears throat> on property zoned uh, SF5, single family residential generally located 400 feet north of uh, West 25th Street and we <clears throat> uh, West and 660, 660 feet west of North Meridian Avenue. Um, is there anyone on the commission that wants to hear this case? Do we have anyone from the public present that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone on remotely that would like to hear this case? If we're not, we'll take 4.4. Next case is uh, conditional use uh, 00040, request in the county for accessory apartment zoned uh, rural residential, generally located on the southwest corner of 63rd Street South and 159th Street East. Is there anyone on the commission that would like to hear this case? Is there anyone present from the public that would like to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we will hear this case. Next case is a CUP community unit uh, plan amendment uh, number 00027 in, in the city. Uh, to DP 218 to develop a warehouse self storage facility on property zoned LC, limited commercial, located approximately 220 feet north of West 21st Street North and on the east side of North 119th West. Is there anyone on the Planning Commission that would like to hear this case? Is there anyone present from the public that would like to hear this case? Is there anyone on remotely that would like to hear this case? If not, we'll take it on consent. Next case is a zoning change 00048 <clears throat> request in the county from rural residential to general commercial with uh, PO361 to permit expansion of a boat and RV storage generally located 1,000 feet uh, south of East 63rd Street South and within 500 feet west of South Hydraulic Avenue. Anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Yes. Okay, we'll hear this case. And uh, we have a DER, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, DER 2023-0004, 20, 
Now that is, uh, we're going to hear this case, right, Scott? Sure, I can explain a little bit more on this one if, if you like. Uh, so this is an item that you've already considered. Uh, what's happened is that uh, because the Unified Zoning Code is both a city and county code, we did the public notice and all the mailings and everything as required per state statute. Uh, we did the public notice in the paper per the city paper. We had to follow up and do a publication in the county paper because we did not get that accomplished with the first go round. So um, that's why this is scheduled for a public hearing today. A second time is to ensure that we're in compliance with following through for the county portion of the zoning code. I want to assure you that the mail out notice and all the required public notices took place as required so that everyone has been notified for this case. Um, again, you've considered it prior. We just did this as a follow up to ensure that we get the public notice published in the county paper and provided this opportunity for any public comment should there be any. Now, in light of the fact that this is a little bit unique because you've already considered this item, I'm aware that Kirk Sponsel uh, with the county has some comments that he'd like to share in terms of a motion for, uh, for advice for you on this one. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Kirk Sponsel, Deputy County Counselor. I can certainly provide um, some potential motion language and considerations, uh, whether that whether this item is resolved by consent or otherwise. And so I'll defer at this time until we find a resolution on whether this item will have further uh, discussion or whether it will go on consent. But if it does go on consent, I would recommend that it be addressed separately from the other consent items. Okay. Uh, so this is really a, a matter of housekeeping. Is there anyone on the Planning Commission that wants to hear this case? Is there anyone present from the public that would like to hear this case? Is there anyone uh, remotely that would like to hear this case? If not, we'll take it on consent and we'll take it by separate motion. And I would just comment ever so briefly just to say that um, last time that you heard it, you recommended that the City Council and the County Commission adopt the recommended changes as recommended by staff. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page for what the previous recommendation was. Okay, just to keep the order, I, I would accept a motion to approve everything except 4.8. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, Mr. McKay. I'd just like to hear legal's uh, motion. Oh, they want okay. to take. So Kirk Sponsel again, Deputy County Counselor. Are we wanting to take item 4.8 before the other consent items then? No. Yeah, we can do that. You bet. I apologize. One second here while I get the page on. I'd like to move that we um, approve items 4.2, 4.4, and 4.6. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve those items. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Kirk Sponsel, Deputy County Counselor, uh, in light of the prior July 27th hearing, uh, if the commission wanted to make the same deliberations and approval, it would be my recommendation that the, that the motion acknowledge the prior hearing. As such, motion language could be that the commission moves to initiate an amendment to the Unified Zoning Code per Unified Zoning Code Article 5C2 and approve the proposed Unified Zoning Code updates, and in doing so, acknowledge and incorporate the prior July 27th hearings reports, testimony, and reasonings into your consideration and approval. Now, if we want to regurgitate that, you can, or alternatively, you can so move as articulated by the Deputy County Counselor. So move. <laughs> Second. Would you repeat that, please? <laughs> Whatever he said. We second. have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 
We'll suspend the uh, MAPC meeting and move to uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. And the first item on the agenda there, I believe, is for the approval of the minutes. Move so to moved. approve. Second. We have some people abstaining, I think. Uh, the same three that were abstaining from the previous uh, commission meeting. I show Mr. Duell, Mr. Nix, Mr. Hartman, and Mr. Aldridge. Okay. Okay, with those people abstaining, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Request uh, for variance in the city to have uh, a zero setback on a through street to increase the height of an off site sign uh, to 54.14 feet on property zoned uh, general industrial, generally located on the west side of North Hydraulic Avenue and East 135. We have heard cases in this area before. It's uh, near the uh, road work of uh, K96 and 135. Uh, is there anyone present that wants to hear this case? Anyone on the commission? Okay. So we have somebody from the audience present that wants to hear the case. We will hear that case. Since that's the only case, uh, we'll go ahead with it. All right. Thank you. Christina Reith, Associate Planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. This is case number BZA 2023-0045. The applicant has two requests. One is a variance to reduce the western front setback from 20 feet to zero feet for an off-site billboard sign. The second request is a variance to increase the height of an off-site billboard sign. The two and a half acre property is zoned General Industrial District and is located at 3223 North Hydraulic Avenue. It is currently developed with a construction machine dealer shop. The applicant is requesting a variance from two regulations set forth by the Wichita Sign Code. The first one limits a property to a maximum height of 30 feet in the General Industrial District. The second one states that all off-site signs shall comply with all building setback lines. The applicant is requesting to place a 54-foot high billboard sign on the southwest side of the lot. Due to the expansion of the abutting ramps from K96 and 135, two billboard signs previously on the property have been condemned and removed by KDOT. According to the applicant, allowing the sign to be placed on the southwest side of the property, along with the requested increase in height, will allow the sign to be visible and out of the business traffic. Skipping ahead here on the report, there are no zoning cases associated with this property. So first we'll address the five criteria for granting a variance for a reduction in setbacks. One, uh, the request is unique to this property and was not created by the applicant. The applicant states that the north part of the construction machine dealer complex was purchased by KDOT for the construction of an on-ramp from K96 to 135. Staff agrees that the circumstances were not created by the applicant. KDOT's acquisition of the right-of-way from the subject property moved the north property line farther south. Two, the granting of the variance will not adversely affect the rights of the adjacent property owners or residents. The applicant states that the reduction in setbacks, namely for the placement of a billboard sign, will not affect the rights of the adjacent property owners. The subject site is located along a state highway where billboards are common. Staff agrees with the above statements. It is staff's opinion that it will not affect the rights of the adjacent property owners and that there is a sufficient buffer between the on-ramp to I-135, 135, sorry, and the subject site's southern property line. Three, the applicant states that the current setbacks will yield a billboard sign placed in the middle of the property's repair operations where there are large trucks with backhoes and other large equipment. Staff agrees that the application of the, the strict application of the code will not permit the applicant to safely advertise a business on site as it did before the KDOT expansion, resulting in unnecessary hardship on the applicant. 
Additionally, because a subject site is on a through lot, there's less need for a setback here. Four, the variance will not adversely affect the public health, safety, morals, order, convenience, prosperity, general welfare, or harmonious development of the community. The applicant states that the allowing the reduction in setbacks for the proposed sign is in public interest and does not detrimentally impact uses or pro projects of public interest. Staff agrees with the above statement and does not anticipate that the variance will adversely affect any of the criteria mentioned. Five, the granting of the variance will not be opposed to the general spirit and intent of the sign code. The applicant states that the setbacks were originally designed for part of the city where lots had frontage on two streets to prevent structures in area that would be considered as a front setback. This is along a limited access highway and there is no need for a setback. Staff agrees that reducing the front setback to zero aligns with the spirit and intent of the code. The unified zoning code allows an applicant to reduce the minimum required setback in areas where a development plan for road improvements has been approved and adopted by the governing body. In this case here, the applicant is requesting a reduction in setbacks adjacent to an on-ramp to I-135. Thus, the request to reduce the setback in light of road improvements is in line with the general spirit and intent of the code. Moving on to the next variance, to increase the height of an off-site sign. First, the applicant states that the north part of the subject site was purchased by KDOT for the expansion of I-135 and the K-96 interchange. A billboard site was previously permitted on site since 1990. As I mentioned earlier, this moved the north property line to the south. Had this not occurred, the site could remain where it is and be able to effectively advertise. Staff agrees that the circumstances were not created by the applicant. Two. Applicant states that the increase in height will not impede the visibility of adjacent property signs. Staff agrees with the statement above. The subject site is located in an industrial area. Additionally, KDOT will not allow any part of a sign to encroach, overhang, or be located on the right of way, nor allow any sign to be higher than 50 feet from above, measured from the above road grade to the top of the sign. Therefore, the position of the sign will not allowed to be affect the adjacent I-135 highway or interchange. Three, the applicant states that the allowed height of the sign would impose an unnecessary hardship. With the 30 feet overall height of the sign, the walkways and lights associated with the sign would be 12 feet, six inches above the driveway in the parking lot. This is not high enough to be avoid being hit by truck or forklift traffic that would service business in the area. It is staff's opinion here that the strict application of the code would not constitute an unnecessary hardship. It is staff's opinion that it is a self-imposed hardship. By relocating the sign, they could use this portion of, the properly, portion of the property differently to accommodate the placement of the sign at the standard 30-foot height. The placement of the sign is at the discretion of the applicant. Four, the applicant states that nothing in this request would have an adverse effect on the public. Staff agrees with this above statement. Five, the applicant states that the billboard is not significantly out of scale and that it reasonably balances the need with the sign with the preservation of the visual qualities of the community. Staff agrees that increasing the height of the billboard sign aligns with the spirit and intent of the code. The applicant's request is similar to that of an administrative adjustment to allow the maximum allowed height of pole signs by up to 25%. Should the board determine that all five conditions necessary to the granting of the variance can be found to exist, then it is a recommendation of the secretary that the variance to reduce this front setback to zero feet be granted, subject to the following conditions that are listed in your staff report. However, the secretary recommends that the variance to increase the height of a billboard sign be denied. Let's go through some of the photos here, please. This is the uh, zoning map of where the subject site is located. Next slide, please. Here is an aerial map. Next slide, please. This is the future growth concept map outlined in the comprehensive plan. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is an applicant submitted aerial of the subject site and where the proposed site is to be located. Next slide, please. This is uh, the proposed location and height of the billboard sign as submitted by the applicant. Next slide, please. 
This is another applicant submitted uh, relocation of the billboard sign. Next slide, please. This is looking north towards the site. Next slide, please. This is looking south towards the proposed billboard location. Next slide, please. This is looking east away from the site. Next slide, please. This is looking south away from the site. Next slide, please. This is looking north away from the site. Next slide, please. This is looking south towards the site. And do I have another photo? Next slide, please. Yep, this is looking way west away from the site. Next slide, please. This is looking west towards the site. And with that, I will stand for questions. Are there any questions of staff on this? Mr. Chair? Yes, Bob. Yeah, I've just got a quick question. The applicant is requesting a 54.14 height, correct? Yes. And KDOT is only going to allow nothing higher than 50 foot, correct? Um, let's see. It says, uh, trying to remember the exact wording here, um, 50 feet measured from the road grade to the top of the sign. So I believe that height might that may that height may be a little different. Okay, then I guess my question is, what would be the variance between what the applicant is requesting and the fifty foot? If you're saying it's going to be different, what what's going to be different? Then? So the the height from the ground of this subject site would from from the bottom to the top would be fifty four point one four feet, and I think from the from the road grade. I'm not sure if they're referring to, because this is from an email from Kelly Grant of K, KDOT. I'm not sure if that refers to the road grade of the subject site or of the highway. OK. Either way you see it, whether or not we approve this or not, KDOT's still going to have to approve Yes, the they still have to go right? through KDOT. Yes. OK. Thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? If not, we'll uh, call on the uh, applicant or agent to speak. Uh, please state your name and address, and you'll have 10 minutes. Good afternoon. My name is David Mulhagen. I'm with Lamar Outdoor Advertising at uh, 390, not 30, excuse me, that's the old address, 2901 South Kansas Avenue. We used to have the, uh, our plant up north here of this site. Starting with uh, this, uh, I would like to refer back to uh, page four of your paper, item number three, the increased uh, height, that we totally disagree. Uh, and this is this whole move is not self-inflicted. It is actually inflicted by KDOT and the city of Wichita. The reason we are here at this BZA is that we were forced into moving by the governing authority, KDOT and the city of Wichita. This hardship is caused by KDOT and the city of Wichita for taking a personal property for the expansion of K96 and the ramps to 135. We have to be compensated per the Constitution, and it's not self-inflicted. Again, we were forced to move from our revenue-generating business, and this caused the hardship. Now, if we were not forced, we would still be there. Now, if you uh, please put the slide to number, page nine. Or on your yours is page nine. I don't know how to see about moving this. Paul, could we go to the applicant submitted aerial, please? There we go. Now, when the governing bodies condemned the north part of this lot, they shortened the area that uh, White Star can, can, could conduct their business. KDOT changed the way that White Star could use this property. They no longer could use this north part for their storage. The area housed their inventory, and they had space to move around in, and we had space to service our sign. Now they have a lot smaller lot to store the same inventory, and thus 
There's no space to move around in. They have to stack it up, they have to line it up, and as one governor said, uh, stack it high and pack it deep, and so that's what they've had to do. There is not any space for us to service our sign in this northern part of the area. We agreed to relocate to this part of the area shown here in blue, but we need the additional height for the truck traffic. This is true. Now, any place along the frontage, we would have to be here again today because the whole area that they have around this is truck traffic. Otherwise, it's storage to the right, and there's not enough space up there. This is this only is move, not only moving our business as a hardship, but if the trucks can't drive through this area and under our sign, limited to 30 feet, you have a clearance of 12 feet, uh, they would have to turn back around and go around the other way, cutting off their circular drive that they can use to get trucks into their loading and unloading docks as well. White Star cannot use the property like it did before the taking. It's caused a hardship and is not a self-imposed hardship. The previous sign that was there has been there for a long time, and I do believe it was a 35-foot overall height and not 30 feet, because, it, like again, it was there for a long time and codes have changed. The staff does not agree that the hardship, this hardship, and agree to our height increase. We hope that you will see that number three is a hardship on us and that you'll agree to um, our request. Then on page five, the staff talks about administrative adjustments. So let's talk about that, seeing as I've got how much time left? Five minutes, good. The specifications for the sign code, I know that JR is here, so he'll keep me right on this. Normally, when we apply for a permit, we can see about taking, you know, eight feet above the adjacent pro or the, uh, over a building if our sign is over a building or if we're adjacent to a raised roadbed, we can go to 14 feet above the grade of the road, okay? So if we use the calculations of, and uh, we did have it surveyed, and if you would like a copy of the code and my calculations, I've got some here I can hand out. The ramp that we were talking about for KDOT, and I do have a, uh, uh, in your packet, you will see that. Uh, KDOT has drawn that to be 1,352.84 feet above sea level. So that's kind of our, our, where we're taking our benchmark at is the, the KDOT drawing. The code says we can increase that height by 14 feet, okay? So that's 1,366.84 um, feet above the of the, uh, the road bed. Okay, the dirt where we're going to actually place the sign is 1,318 feet. Subtract that, 48.14 feet. That's what we can ask for with JR. Boom. Here we go. We write it out. We provide the survey. We show where the benchmark is, or where the ground is, where the sign is. We show where the elevation of the road bed is. You add 14 feet, it's a given we can see about doing that. We don't have to go through all this. The second part that we can, and JR is part of this as well, he gets to be a, lot, a part of a lot of things, is a, co a sign code adjustment, administrative adjustment. Okay? We take that same scenario, but we apply for an adjustment. Now, it doesn't have to come before BZA, but it's an adjustment that... Um, JR, and I forget who the other gentleman is. Planning director. Planning director. They take a look at our application, and they take a look to make sure that we have, you know, the benchmark of where the ground is, where the benchmark of the, uh, the height of the road or guardrail is, and then you add 20 feet to that, subtract that out, and that's how high overall the sign can be. Going through all that calculations, using the same numbers, and if you do want, I do have a certified um, survey that you can have, and we can put it in for everybody else. But the overall height of the sign at ground level per a administrative adjustment would be 54.14 feet, what we're asking for. 
Now, you had asked earlier about KDOT. Okay, KDOT, their ruling is that the sign cannot be more than 20 feet above the road bed. Now, they take in consideration the ramp, which we're only asking for 20 feet above that. So we're below the 50 feet. But even if you take it down to I-135, we had that surveyed as well. And if you take the top of our sign that we're requesting, 1,372.84, and the edge of the concrete, which was surveyed, 1,326.13, you get a total height above I-135 at 46.17 feet. Well within KDOT's 50%, or not 50, 50-foot 50 rule. And in that email that uh, you forward to me from Kelly, she was asking, well, we need to make sure that um, they stay on the property, not in the road right away. Well, on our same survey that we did, we had pins, property pins set at the corner where we're planning on putting our board and then 30 feet on either side of it to mark the property line. So when we put our pole in the ground, we make sure that we are on private property and not overhanging for KDOT. And we would appreciate your uh, acceptance and uh, approval of our um, overall height of 54 feet. Um, if you don't, then I guess we can see about going through the Board of Zoning Appeals uh, because, again, they're the same height. I stand for question. Thank you. Um, there's been a lot of detail about various heights, but the, the point that staff made when they said that one of the criteria was not met was that you could move the sign to some place where the 30-foot height was acceptable. So for me to understand better about what's going on with that, looking at this aerial, there's a red line around this parcel which is the parcel under discussion, but there appear to be three other parcels to the north. Did KDOT take all three of those? No, up here where this angle is, is where KDOT took. All this inventory that's up here had to be moved down into this area. Okay. okay. And all so. Right. We but were... you still have the two parcels to the north of the parcel outlined in red. You still have your access onto hydraulic and you still have some of that parking lot, correct? I'm trying to see where your theoretical locations for this sign could be. Anywhere and it's not right, confined. This corner right here? See, this is where our billboard used to be at. Yes. So anywhere from this point, yes, all the way down through here, anywhere along this line. This area up here, the, the owners have already said that we are stacking because we have to change the way that we come into the business and use the business land for our trucks, for our uh, semis, to get our inventory out, to get our rentals out. They have to use more of this area, and uh, we have, they are taking up all this area right in through here for their um, storage. Okay, and so they, what they, we've agreed to is to keep out of their storage, because we have to have access to get into the service assigned. I... I, I think you've answered my question. I'm just trying to understand how much actual land is within the possibility of locating this sign. And it's the parcel outlined in red plus the two parcels to the north. But you're still maintaining that that entire parking lot is being used for purposes that don't allow a sign to be there, correct? At the 30-foot height, yes. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions? Of yes, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Aldrich. Sir, it sounds like what you're saying, due to what KDOT has done there, that they've created a shipping and receiving nightmare for you. Is that correct? They have, uh, as far as the on-site business goes, they've had to uh, uh, rearrange all the way that they actually get the trucks in and uh, unload and get the trucks loaded up for the rentals and get them out. They've had to totally re readjust because you can't move the building, so you have to move everything else that's around the building and accommodate, you know, for that. Okay, thank you, sir. 
Any other questions of the applicant? If not, thank you for your presentation. Is there anyone from the public that uh, would like to speak on this matter? Anybody present? Is there anybody uh, on virtually that would like to speak on this issue? If not, I bring it back to the commission. Uh, discussion? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Aldridge. I have a question for, for staff. Do we, as far as the recommendations, do we need to take two separate recommendations or can it be done under one? You have to take two separate recommendations. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if there is no other discussion, I'd like to make a, make a motion. Is there any other discussion? If not, go ahead and make your motion. Can I just say if you're going to make a motion, which I suspect you might be, to two motions to approve, you, you will need to do a separate finding, correct? Okay. I, I suppose I will offer the guidance that uh, it can be as simple as saying uh, I, you know, I make the motion that we find that they meet all five of the criteria to be granted a variance. And in the instance where uh, the one that we had recommended, we would said that there had not been, you could not find, make a finding, I think all you have to do is simply state that you find that, yes, uh, they do meet the criteria because of the challenges and hardship to their business. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd like to make a motion, uh, the first motion, um, that we approve uh, the zero uh, setback uh, based on the staff recommendations and criteria that's uh, as given. Does that work? And that you find that the, it meets the five criteria for a variance. Yes, I believe it does. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Now, is it proper to make the same motion for the, for the second? I would so do. I'm looking at Jeff, and I I would say yes to make sure that you say find that they meet the five criteria to meet the, for a variance. Yes, and we find that meets the five criteria for a variance. So that's my motion. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, a quick question. That is for approval yes. of with the applicant's request at 54.14, correct? Okay. All those, in, all those in favor say aye. 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 In uh, BZA, so we will reconvene planning commission meeting and we will go back to uh, item number 2.1 now we deferred that right four point three it is call on staff to give us a, a report Hello everyone, this is Mumita Kundu with the planning department. I'm presenting case uh, CON 2023 0038. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to permit live music and entertainment defined as nightclub in the city associated with hotel and restaurant uses on the property zoned LI limited industrial district. The site is 1720 North Web Road, generally located northeast corner of North Web Road and Waterfront Parkway. The site is 2.02 acres in size and developed with a strip store center currently. If you could move to the site plan that the applicant has provided. The applicant, along with the restaurant, intends to have a cigar patio on the property 
and indoor and outdoor music and entertainment. As per the site plan, the patio is located on the south and southeast of the building and faces the vacant wooded parcel to the east and commercial offices south of the site. The need for conditional use at this location is due to the proximity of SF5 single family residential zoning to the west and the church to the north. If you could move to the zoning map. The subject is located roughly 104 feet from the residential zoning to the west and roughly 100 feet from the church to the north. Supplementary use regulations of the Unified Zoning Code require a conditional use for a nightclub in the city when it is within 300 feet of a residential zoning, a church, or a place for worship. This conditional use does permit outdoor service of food and drink as an accessory operation of the establishment. The live music and entertainment proposed on the subject site shall confirm to this supplementary use regulations which are stated in the staff report. According to the site plan provided, the parking for the subject is located primarily to the west. If you could move to the third site plan provided by the applicant, please. Mm -hmm. The parking is uh, primarily located to the west of the existing building. There appears to be roughly 96 parking spaces. The parking standard for the nightclub in the city is one space for every two occupants. The nightclub in the city has approximately a seating arrangement of 167 occupants. So the parking availability meets the minimum requirements. An existing screening wall on the west on the residentially zoned parcels and existing shaded trees along the railroad to the north serves as the required screening and landscaping. If you could move to the community investment plan slide. The proposed application is in conformance to the community investment plan. The map identifies the area which the site is located to be appropriate for new residential and employment mix. Based upon the information available at the time of the report, at the time the report was prepared, staff recommends the conditional use to be approved subject to conditions mentioned in the staff report. At the publication, at the time of the publication of the staff report, the staff doesn't, didn't receive any public comment, but um, a public comment came in later on. Uh, it was neither opposing or uh, supporting this project, but uh, for more information on this. And this case was heard at the DAB 2 on September 11, 2023 and approved by 5-1 votes. And let's go through the site photos one by one. Looking to north towards the site. Next. Looking north towards the site, that's, I think, where the patio is going to be constructed. Next. Looking east towards the site. Next. Looking north away from the site. Next. Looking east away from the site. Next. Looking south away from the site. Next. Looking south away from the site. Again, next, looking west away from the site, and that's the residential zoning, which is screened by an existing wall. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Any questions uh, from the commission? Yes, Ms. Foster. You had said the DAB, I believe, approved it 5-1. Do you know or do you recall what the one person who objected was objecting to? Uh, they were objecting to the noise uh, that is possibly to, uh, might be generated because of the entertainment uh, aspect. Uh, the applicant's agent was there to answer the question, and the conditions that have been given in the staff report is designed specially to mitigate that possible negative effect of the noise. Thank you. Any other questions? from the commission if not we'll uh, call on the applicant or agent you'll have 10 minutes please uh, state your uh, name and address 
Good afternoon, Phil Meyer with Boffman Company 315 Ellis, um, agent for the applicant. So what we're um, asking for today is your um, nightclub in the city. But what we're trying to do is we've done numerous times in front of the planning commission to, to be able to have live music and entertainment, and that's all we're doing. This business is going to, it's not a nightclub. Its liquor license will be under a restaurant as its main business. So this will be a restaurant. It has a patio outside um, and will operate as a restaurant facility. We're looking to be, to be able to do the music indoor and outdoor. There is a very small eight, 10 foot wide patio on the south side. There is a wider patio over here on the east side. 80% of the patio on the east side is now covered, which didn't show up in those photos. The entire patio on the south side is covered. We've got 750 feet from this patio to the church to the north. There's over 400 feet from this patio to any residential house, which would be this one um, on the west side of Webb Road. I think with the covering that goes over that patio that's there today, with all the vegetation that's sitting back here today, there will be minimum noise that comes out of this. We're not doing rock bands back here. We're having one, two, three people bands that are just playing music like you run into in any restaurant out there. Um, so with that, I will probably stop at that point and answer any questions you may have. Mr. Hartman, can you please use your microphone for the folks online? Right. Uh, isn't there a masonry wall along that residential property to the west? Yeah, along with not only a masonry wall, but some good vegetation here also. Okay. Yes. Mr. Aldridge. Uh, yes, sir. Um, do you agree to all the staff recommendations and comments as given? We do. We're in agreement with all five of the conditions of approval and have no issue with those. Thank you, sir. Any other questions of the applicant from the uh, commission? If not, is this I have one question. Sorry, uh, is this patio something that'll be primarily used seasonally? I mean, is or is it heated and screened and they'll always be open? Or oh, I think it's going to be heated, but I your seasonally is how it's going to operate because you get into the dead of summer or you get into winter and there will be few people out there. So when Even the trees don't have it. leaves and the vegetation's died down, probably you aren't going to be out there. We're not going to ask somebody to play music out there in January. <laughs> not even Frosty the Snowman. Uh, okay. Well, I won't say it will never happen, but it won't be a regular occurrence, no. Any other questions of the uh, applicant? Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody present to, from the public that would like to speak on this? On Zoom. Is there anybody virtual that would like to speak on this? I would. And I think there's some other people too on Zoom that would like to speak okay. as well. Would you yes. uh, please would. Uh, state would. your name yes. and address? Yes. And you'll have uh, three minutes. Did you say me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, this is Ellen Barron. I am directly affected by this conditional use change. I own the property two lots, two directly west of this property from the railroad track or bike path straight down two lots. My neighbors are also on this call. Um, I would like to discuss the fact that this is not a typical area where you would normally have music. We have complete residential across the street. Noise nu nuisance is definitely a concern. I think that the applicant and the people working on this have minimized and tried to tell you that the screening on Web Road for our neighborhood, the wall and the trees is enough screening for the noise. That's not true. The trees do not stay green once the leaves fall off the 
trees. So that's not gonna be a natural barrier. And the wall is not a high wall. You could hop over the wall. Actually, we have some security concerns about that. So we do not have any protection from the noise from this neighborhood. Our bedrooms are here. We will hear the music at night. Um, I, we hear the cars on Web Road. So if we can hear the cars on Web Road, we're gonna hear the music. Um, it doesn't um, matter that the patio is on the east side of the building or the south, we will still hear it. I haven't heard anything about doing any screening, sound barriers, sound padding or anything. I think that they may tell you that they're gonna have one to three musicians, but I'm familiar with the owners, other properties where they have live bands. That would be a tremendous problem for us in our neighborhood. Um, let's see what else I need to tell you. And I just think that this is not an appropriate proposal that you should be considering live music on a patio, given the extent to which the entire west line across the street are homes, private homes with bedrooms backing up right there to Web Road. Let me see if I have anything else to say. And then not only is it not appropriate to put this by a neighborhood, it's a complete noise nuisance. Um, also, it does affect our property values. And this is not appropriate to be putting in the ability to have live music outside. Thank That's you, it. For uh, would comments. you please state your address? Ellen Barron, 1739 North Duck Cross Cove, Wichita, Kansas, 67206. My husband, Adam Barron, is also on this call. We own two lots heading from north to south along that west line. Thank and then you. there are some other neighbors that are also on this call that would like to speak. The neighbor directly south to me cannot be on the call, but they have concerns. Um, and then two doors down, right by the web gate, um, they also have concerns, but I they weren't able to join the call today. So this isn't just me, one property owner complaining, there are other property owners along this west line that are concerned. Do we have anybody Hello? else remotely that would like to speak? I have a question. Yes. Excuse me, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, uh, did you all make a presentation at the DAB meeting? Are you talking to me, Ellen yeah. Barron? Yes. I was not aware that this was happening. I don't think I was notified, and if I was aware, I was not made aware of it. Thank you. I, or I would have had I known. Mr. Hartman. Yes, ma'am. How high is the wall next to your house? I would have to measure it. This is an issue for all the foliage. It's not very high. It's not going to screen uh, for noise. In fact, we as the neighborhood would like to have the wall higher, but we haven't talked about that. When I had security work done at my house, um, someone could easily from Web Road go over the fence. So you, by no you, means is it going to provide noise would barrier you protection. Would, would you say it's between six and eight feet high? Uh, I cannot answer that. I can tell it. Hold on, let me look. Hi, I'm. if you guys would like, I can also turn on my video and show you from I'm standing in my kitchen staring at the front door of the establishment and I have somebody who can go out and stand and show you how tall the wall is but it really won't provide any sound barrier so no you're trying to make it seem like now. that's insurance that the neighbors won't be affected is ridiculous we can only have one speaking at a time please okay is there somebody else that would like to speak on this issue if so please identify yourself yes. your name and address and you have three minutes Molly, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Molly Moore. My address is 1720 North Duck Cross Cove, Wichita, Kansas, 67206. And I live just south of Ellen Barron. Um, and I am currently standing in my kitchen looking at the, the thing that you guys are talking about for the live music. Um, there is zero foliage between my house and that corner. The wall is probably just over six feet tall. Um, I have children who sleep here, nap here on the weekends. Um, and live music is just not something that we are interested in having by us. Does anybody uh, have any questions of this uh, applicant or this 
If not, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this issue remotely? If so, please identify yourself and your name and your address. You have three minutes. Yes, yes. 1636 North Bullage Drive, 67206. We're just a few houses in from the back gate where it would be, and we have all the same concerns as Molly and Ellen expressed. The noise, the crowd, maybe that it would draw over there and wondering why it has to be zoned as a nightclub, wondering what hours it would be open until. There's lots of small kids. I know Molly's backs right up to it and that wall is not that tall. I'd say it's maybe six and a half, seven feet in the vegetation is pretty limited back there. Is there anyone else remotely that would like to speak on this? And please uh, don't repeat what somebody has already told us. If you have any new uh, comments or evidence, uh, please state your name and address and you'll have three minutes. This is Ellen Barron. I would just like to be clear that the other neighbors along the west side did have concerns too. They just could not join the Zoom today. Ma'am, you've already spoken. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak remotely? If not, I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, yes, we want to call the agent back up to uh, respond to the comments. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll try to be. I'll try to be quick here. I know I got two minutes, so I may ask for a little extra if I need. But um, I'm going to go back to basics. This thing operates as a restaurant inside and outside on the patio. And you've all been in restaurants where they have the live music. This is not rock bands playing. This patio, and we can look back through the slides if you like. This patio on the east side is covered. They showed you their site plans. The only logical place for the band to operate is going to be the music to occur is going to be on the east side of this building. So if it's covered, we have the vegetation back here. We have a five lane arterial street. I think they're going to hear traffic from the vehicles before they ever hear music from the venue because we're not going to be playing that that loud. If there's planning commissioners who want me to explain that further, I, we can go back through the slides and I can show you that stuff there. But I would think the traffic um, on Webb Road is a more of a noise issue for anybody on the west side. I do believe, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, I think Mrs. Barron lives in these two houses. Um, and that's all I could figure out in the short time I was sitting there from the three that spoke of where their houses are related to to this. So with that, I'll answer any questions you may have. Phil, can you can you get uh, a couple of other slides up? I know you think that's redundant, but just to show us exactly where that patio is. Yes. Can we just start with the first slide in the presentation and go back one one by one? So this is the patio on the south side. You can see it's covered, 100% covered. The patio on the east is 80% covered with that same type of cover. So that's going to knock down a lot of noise that may come out of there. Next slide, please. This is that patio. It has since been covered. This was during the middle construction. 80% of this patio is covered. You can see how close the vegetation is to the edge of the patio. Next, please. That's the front of the facility and the restaurant is this portion of the building. Next, please. You can go to the um, architectural plans. Let's we back up a couple. All right there you go. 
So this is the, well, one more. There's one more in there that helped me earlier in the first presentation. There we go. Um, so this is the front door. This is the south patio here. This is the north or the east patio here. Now, these tables are all movable and things can adjust, but logically your live music is going to occur up in this location playing, playing that way. So I think all we've talked about about the noise buffer is pretty significant to help knock that down. Can you confirm, uh, Phil, there is an atrium on the west side of the building that would be closest to the residential. That atrium wouldn't be open. There wouldn't be music amplified in that area or on that side at all. It's not open to the outdoors. Is that accurate? Correct. Correct. That's the main entrance into the restaurant. And, and you're agreeing to the hours of operation, which appear to, be, appear to be very reasonable. Yes, we're in agreement with all five conditions. Mr. Green? Yeah, Phil, so the entertainment's going to be on the east side of the building, not the south side? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? If not, I will bring it back to the commission for discussion. I'd like to make a motion to approve subject to the staff comments. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 I show the next case uh, to be discussed is uh, Con twenty twenty three zero zero four zero. Good afternoon, everyone. Christina Reith again with the planning department. The applicant is requesting a conditional use to allow an accessory apartment on a property zoned rural residential. The thirty eight acre subject site is located at one five six two nine East sixty third Street South. The subject site is currently developed with a single family residential dwelling and a vacant barn structure. And that vacant barn structure will be converted into an accessory apartment. Paul, could we please go to the site plan that was submitted by the applicant? Thank you. So um, the applicant plans to utilize the existing gravel driveway off East 63rd Street North to access the proposed accessory apartment. It will measure 60 feet by 40 feet and is located approximately 512 feet southeast from the principal structure. Uh, if you guys can see my mouse here, this is the principal structure and then this is the proposed accessory apartment. The Unified Zoning Code defines an accessory apartment as a dwelling unit that may be wholly within or may be detached from a principal single family dwelling unit. They are subject to the supplementary use regulations that are listed in your staff report. Now the principal structure has a septic system, but would like a separate lagoon for the accessory apartment. There is a pond on site between the main and accessory structures, as you can see in the site plan here, that would prevent the sewer lines from being connected. Because the applicant plans to have the accessory apartment on a separate sewer system, they're therefore requesting a waiver of the supplementary use regulation D6A4. And that waiver must be approved by the Central County Board of County Commissioners. And um, once we look through the site photos, it is staff's opinion that the vacant barn structure is compatible with the principal dwelling unit as um, identified in regulation number two. The character of the area is low density uh, residential and rural. There are no zoning cases associated with this property. The request for an accessory apartment is in conformance with the community investments plan. The future growth concept map identifies the site as being in a rural growth area. This category encompasses land outside the 2035 urban growth areas for Wichita and the small cities, agricultural uses, rural based businesses, and larger lots, residential exurban subdivisions will likely will be developed in this area. Based upon the information available prior to the public hearings, Planning staff recommends that the request for the accessory apartment, which includes a waiver of supplementary use regulation number four, be approved with the following conditions that are listed in your staff report. This recommendation is based on the golden rules that we all abide by. 
I will just skip ahead to the last golden rule, opposition or support from neighborhood residents. I did receive um, a total, well, several phone calls just curious about the development application, but they weren't necessarily opposed or in support of the requested accessory apartment. And with that, I will go to site photos, please. So this is looking south towards the site. Uh, and you can see the, um, the barn that they are converting into the accessory structure. Next slide, please. This is looking south towards the principal structure. Next slide, please. This is looking east at the accessory apartment. Next slide, please. This is looking south towards the accessory apartment. Next slide, please. This is looking west towards the site. Next slide, please. This is looking east. This is where they plan to construct the proposed lagoon. Next slide, please. This is looking, uh, this is taking a picture from the proposed accessory apartment towards 63rd Street. So this is the gravel driveway that they will utilize for the site. Next slide, please. This is looking east away from the site. This is the border of uh, Cedric County and Butler County. Next slide, please. This is looking west away from the site. Next slide, please. This is looking north away from the site um, towards a residential property. Next slide, please. And that concludes my photos. And with that, I will stand for questions. Mr. Hartman. Could you use your microphone, please? Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Uh, Hartman. In item three, it says the appearance of the accessory structure shall be compatible with the main dwelling. Is, is the, that building looks like a metal well, building yes it will be renovated okay yes that was my <laughs> and there's no possibility of access to rural water service rural s sanitary sewer uh, so for this, any municipality or yeah so the service. subject side is served by rural water district three but no sanitary sewer is that they're going to yeah. use a lagoon for that yeah but they couldn't access any sanitary sewer that in any other way, correct? Uh, I believe so. Any other questions of staff? Christine, I have a question. Yes. So I know when they remodel, it's supposed to look similar to the house. I'm just curious, if the barn's been standing there and looking as it is, why does it need to look similar to the house? Because that's part of, oh, I'm sorry. I would say when it, comes to accessory apartments in the county there has been his historically there has been times where like Morton buildings or existing metal structures have been deemed compatible with the structure because those types of buildings exist typically on larger acreages and you know if somebody's adding an accessory apartment to an existing structure on the site that's generally been deemed as being compatible or um, like the house because that building has already existed does that make sense? There's no more questions. I call on the agent or applicant. You have uh, 10 minutes. Please state your name and address. I believe they are online. Jesse, are you online? I'm trying to unmute it. There you go. We can hear you. Am I yep. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Jesse Galarza, and I'm at 15629 63rd Street South in Derby, Kansas, 67037. And I am wanting to turn this barn that I pretty much grew up in um, feeding cows and stuff, but now we don't have animals, so we're just wanting to turn it into a home and make it look like the primary one. Um, I'll stand for questions. Is there anybody on the commission that has questions of the applicant? Yes. Could you describe what you're planning to do on the exterior of the building? 
Yeah, so the exterior is going to be um, siding, which is like a brick, brick and siding. On all sides of the structure or just that side? Yes, all, all sides of the structure. And then we're planning on doing um, the same kind of roof. It's it's a um, an asphalt shingle. Well, right now it has metal, but we're going to turn it into an asphalt shingle. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Aldridge, uh, yes, uh, do you agree to all of staff recommendations uh, and comments as given? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions uh, for the applicant from the commission? If not, is there anyone present who would like to speak on this case? Uh, state your name and address, please, and you will have three minutes. My name is Catherine Clark. We're at 15610 East 66th Street South. We're the property directly south of Vega property. Um, my biggest concern is not so much the property values, because it is considered like a barnuminium that they're putting in there, is their lagoon and septic system. We have issues on our property now where there's drainage that comes from the Vega property. It comes down and it goes back behind our end of our property and it runs into the pond of our neighbor's property to the west of us. And so I'd like to know where they're gonna put in a septic system or lagoon system that's not gonna affect that drainage because they have that drainage on their property also. It starts at the corner of 66, uh, 63rd and 159th or County Line Road, as they call it. Um, and that drainage comes all the way down. It comes back down the bottom of our property. And those are my main concerns because the uh, township does not take care of our roads. All of the gutters in the 30 years we've lived there are almost closed and the water just sits in that whole area. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else present that would like to speak on this? Is there anyone on virtually that would like to speak on this case? I would like to speak if I can. Please state your name and address and you'll have three minutes. Uh, Mr. Duell, I Perfect. believe that that's the applicant. Uh, so she'll I'm have sorry. an opportunity for rebuttal. Yeah, you'll have a rebuttal. Is there anybody else uh, from the public other than the applicant that would like to speak on this? If not, we will bring it back to uh, the applicant and you will have two minutes rebuttal on this. Please go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Um, yes, there is a creek there that uh, we've had problems with the neighbors with. There, like she said, there's really nothing we can do about it. Um, we will be doing the septic on this barn far, um, far east as we can. Like uh, Christina was saying, with the proposed septic will be. Thank you. Thank you. If there's nobody else virtually that wants to speak on this, I'll bring it back to the commission for action. What is the, what's the rule about the platting and drainage plans in the county for a case like this? There's no. Well, they're, they're not adding anything. We're not changing nothing. It's been what it is. And I mean, the, the septic tank will have to be permitted. If I, if yeah, I could. There's no draining changes. We have Kelly Dixon here uh, with MABCD, and I think he can provide some additional insight into the permitting process, just to provide that background for everyone who's paying attention to the case. Good afternoon, Kelly Dixon, Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department. Um, the, the answer to the question about the location of the lagoon, as far as the drainage goes, we go out of our way to make sure that we don't get our wastewater systems in drainage areas uh, because one, it would flood a septic system, two, it can erode away at the lagoon. So as part of the planning process for the permitting of the wastewater system, that's one of the things we're gonna be looking at. Um, and we'll be working with the uh, license installer to make sure that we don't interrupt that drainage. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Any further comments on this case? Bob? I'd like to make a motion to approve uh, per staff recommendations uh, and comments and, and then the further uh, discussions that we had. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Next, I show that we have a zoning case 2023-00048. Yes, good afternoon, Planning Commission. Philip Ziebenbergen with Planning Staff. Zone 2348 is a zone change request from RR Rural Residential District to GC General Commercial District. Staff is recommending approval with protective overlay number 361. It is generally located uh, southwest of the intersection of East 63rd Street South and South Hydraulic Avenue. It is in unincorporated Sedgwick County, though the city limits of Wichita um, are very nearby. Before I get into the details of this request, um, I'm going to do a little bit of history on the site. I'll just leave it here on the zoning map for now. In 2021, uh, a zone change request which was zone 2020-53, was approved for this upside down L-shaped portion of the site. And protective overlay 361 was established for that portion of the property. After the approval of this zone change, the applicant, Mr. Fox, who resides on the property abutting to the west, completed a boundary shift to move this property line right here to the west to make a more rectangular, holistic, contiguous property that's no longer an L shape. His intention was to then allow for a larger vehicle storage facility. And in order to do so, he needs to zone this 1.25 acre piece of land that is now um, part of the larger parcel to general commercial in order to allow for the vehicle storage yard to be constructed over this portion of the property as well. Paul, if you want to go to the site plan, please. Well, there's a site plan included in your staff report, and I was just going to indicate where this 1.25 acre portion of the property um, was in relation to the rest of the property, but it's kind of neither here nor there. Um, I would comment that um, the original zone change request was fairly controversial. It went back and forth from the Board of County Commissioners to the Planning Commission at least once. Um, and the end result was the Board of County Commissioners approving the zone change with a very robust protective overlay that is listed in your staff report. The action today cannot change any of the items of the protective overlay for the broader property. This is not an amendment to that protective overlay. This is a separate zone change request. Staff is recommending approval subject to that protective overlay to expand the protective overlay into this property so that the same rules apply to the contiguous parcel so that there's no questions on enforcement or what's applied and what's not applied here and there. Much of the protective overlay talks about screening and landscaping along East 63rd and South Hydraulic. <clears throat> Through the processing of this case, uh, there has been zero public input. I have not had a phone call. There has not been an email from surrounding neighbors. As you recall, it was fairly heavily involved with the surrounding property owners the very first time. This zone change request was considered by the Citizens Advisory Board for County District 2 this last Tuesday on September 12th. There were no members of the public who spoke at this hearing. The result of the Citizens Advisory Board is they recommended approval of this zone change request 11 to 1. I will say that they did so fairly reluctantly. The original recommendation from the CAB was to deny the very first one. Their uh, opinion of this one was, well, there's seven and some odd acres of property zone, or probably five, um, 
the larger portion was already zoned. They didn't necessarily like the idea, but that 1.25 additional acres tucked in the corner away from the street frontages was likely not going to change um, the intention of what was already going to be approved anyway, since uh, the applicant can and will likely be developing a boat and RV storage facility on the larger piece of property. He just wants to be able to have a bit of a larger facility um, in order to do so. So with that, I think just for time's sake, um, I will stand for any questions and we do have an agent for the applicant with us uh, in person this afternoon. Are there any questions of staff? Seeing none, we'll call on the agent or applicant. You'll have 10 minutes to speak. Uh, please state your name and address. Kirk Miller, K.E. Miller Engineering, 117 East Lewis. I'm the agent, and we're fine with staff comments. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your brief comments. Quick question. <laughs> Uh, we have questions of the applicant. Yes, Mr. Aldridge. Uh, yes, sir. Just to be straight, all he's doing is taking what's existing approvals. He's, that's already there. Mm -hmm. He just bringing in to squaring up his property. Right. He's, he's bringing in that other parcel. Okay. And it's going to be the same restrictions and everything. Yeah, else. just cleaning everything up. <laughs> so, yep. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions of the applicant? Um, if not, we'll call on, yes, excuse me, go ahead, Mr. McKay. Mr. Miller, there was a lot of requirements on the first part. Is, is the applicant gone through and done those from the first part? Well, he hasn't built anything yet, but that's part of him getting his building permit and everything else is meeting those requirements. Yes. He's aware of the requirements. And well, I know he's aware of it, but I thought that, you know, this was so controversial that they were going to do it right away, but I guess they did Right, they haven't started building anything yet. Any further questions of uh, the applicant? Um, is there anybody present that would like to speak on this? Is there anybody remotely that would like to speak on this case? If there is, you have three minutes. State your name and address. Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the uh, commission. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the, the application of the request uh, per staff recommendations and comments. Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That is all the uh, regular business we have at this point. Uh, we have some items uh, or an item to discuss with the commission regarding visual uh, virtual uh, meeting formats. Uh, Scott, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I can just uh, highlight the background on this one real quick. Uh, this has been, a, uh, I think, a, an item of discussion that comes up every so often uh, at the last MAPC meeting, I believe it was. Um, we had had some technical issues as far as getting the system uh, running, and I think I know prior to that at the subdivision committee meeting, we actually found out that the Zoom system wasn't even working at all, and we had to do a quick shift uh, over to Teams. So I think that those are two uh, incidents that kind of led up to the MAPC meeting discussion about um, consideration of whether or not the virtual format should be offered during and for MAPC meetings. and so. Uh, we just put together just a quick staff report just to kind of give you some history and some context on that. And with that, I'll, I'll stand for any questions. Ms. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion ready if you would like to hear it. If we don't have any discussion. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we return to in-person meetings only unless and until another lockdown is mandated, which would require returning to declaring an emergency to have virtual meetings. Second. Um, I'd just... like to offer a substitute motion that we continue to provide the option to participate in virtual meetings. I think it's brought about um, 
different attendance to these meetings and I know it's been challenging for some commissioners to make some of the meetings so second we have a second on the substitute motion discussion well I would just can I, comment Scott, can, on can I ask uh, a pardon can I ask Scott a question oh sure go ahead um, is there a lot of extra work to do it? You know, um, I guess I'll go through a couple things. Uh, number one, once we get the link established, it's the same link and same information consistently throughout the meetings. Um, in terms of the technology itself, we even prior to virtual meetings were recording the meetings. So we still had the camera set up, still had the control room, we're still operating that. In this case, what we do is we um, add additional devices to be able to send it directly out to the internet. Uh, we've done that. We've got the equipment. Um, it's just a matter of us of making sure that the equipment is functioning. And I think that that's been our biggest challenge is just frankly having a checklist and going through that prior to getting the meeting started. And we've we've had some curveballs thrown at us um, with Zoom recently, but. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of making sure that the microphones work, that we're receiving audio, that we're transmitting audio, and then simply that we've got the system up and running. But as simple as I make that sound, if something does go wrong, it's, um, it's, additional, it's, it's, it's additional things that we need to have provided if we advertise it in the public notice. Uh, and if it, if it fails and if it doesn't work, then we have to reschedule the meeting because we're not able to meet the obligations that we set forth in the public notice. Is it possible to split it apart? Um, can you say a little bit more about that? Well, give the option of, of board members to do virtual, but don't have virtual um, input from the public. You, you, I believe that you can, and I believe we're having kind of an open conversation here, so I'm going to also look for legal cons consultation on this. But I believe that you can. In the bylaws, the bylaws provide the opportunity for you to offer the virtual format. Um, it doesn't require you to do that. So um, I think that you have the option of, of splitting it, if you wish, to say members of the public have to show up in person, but members of the MAPC may participate virtually. I've, I've taken advantage as you know, of the virtual. But I sure get a lot more out of it when I'm here. And I would ask, can the virtual component require both audio and visual participation? Because that's the hardest part, I think, when you're facilitating, not being able to see who's speaking, uh, not to be able to connect their identity to the voice. Um, but I know that's the co equipment of a public participant. We can't really manage that, but could we require? I'd, I'd venture to say that, yes, you could require it. But I think part of the challenge would be enforcing it, because then you would have to, con you know, so uh, Mr. Doe joins in, but he doesn't turn on his camera. Then it would be up to staff or the uh, chairperson to remind them, well, you have to turn on your camera. Well, in an instance where they just go ahead and they provide their testimony without turning on the camera, then you would be faced with the difficult situation of do we accept that testimony or do we not accept it because they didn't have their camera on? I don't think I'm going to be able to support the substitute motion. I, I like, I think it should be the same for everybody. Mr. Bill Johnson. Yeah, I think uh, the other part of it when it's virtual. You don't see them, you can't control them. They keep wanting to talk. If they don't, if somebody on the commission says something, they think they can speak back to us, and you can't do it when you're present. So there's no control of that. And I think they're more vocal when you can't see them versus being in person face to face. Mr. Aldridge. I just believe that if it's important enough to a, an agent or an applicant, um, to go through the process, to file, uh, they need to be here. If it's important enough to anybody that's in opposition of that, they need to be here. Uh, and you know, that's just my stance on it. So. Yes, Ms. Foster. I, I understand it's technical difficulties and that there will be technical problems and it's more work for staff. 
but I do think everybody here by definition can sit in a meeting all afternoon in the middle of a, a work day, work week, but a lot of people can't. And I think the amount and quality of public participation we've been getting, and mind you, I started during COVID, so I was never in part of the meetings on the other way, but I think making it easy for the public to part easier for the public to participate is important. And if we can do that, we should. And I realize it does make it make the administration of the meeting a little more challenging, but I think it can be done. Um, you simply need to talk back and make sure everybody understands clearly that like that conversation today with multiple people on the phone, that was a new one. But I think there would be a way to handle that if we decide we need to. Mr. Bill Johnson. Uh, staff, uh, back in the day, wasn't that why the DAB was established so people could go to a meeting at night and not come to this? I, I, I don't have the full history on the DABs, but I do believe that it was formed in order to provide another uh, venue for uh, input and another uh, resource for the council members. I think the challenge with that is, you know, I sat at a DAB meeting last week and heard a case that had already been heard at the, at the Planning Commission and had already been decided on. So those voices aren't heard at this Planning Commission in regards to whatever support or objections that they have. This is 2023. We, we're not still, you know, 1999 or 1975 or whatever. I know for myself, in addition, it's been a tough year for me uh, with my health. And if we, if I hadn't had the option to participate virtually, I would, I would have missed probably 90% of the meetings because I've been very, very ill. I also can agree that we can get participation from people that don't have jobs like I do or some other people do. And I don't think we should exclude. I think the battery just gave it. What, uh, Mr. Green. Yeah, with regards to um, public comment and, and hearing public comment uh, and having votes already taken place by this commission and then going to the district advisory board, uh, the district advisory board is set up to provide feedback for the council member on any given item. The planning commission is also a, an avenue for the council member to receive feedback from, from this uh, body. Um, the council member then takes that information from the district advisory board and also the, the planning commission, and then they factor in what they think is the best answer for any given case or issue. So whether the planning commission meets first or the district advisory board meets first, really has no significance on how the council member utilizes that information. I think, though, there's no public notice that goes out about the district advisory board meeting for them to be able to speak at. Is that correct? We include the district advisory board information in our public notice letter. So they're notified of the planning commission and the district advisory board at the same time. Mr. Joe Johnson? As you know, I've been overruled many times about <laughs> asking for the DAB to meet before we meet. And I think it's important to do that if we're going to not, if we're going to go by the theory that people can talk at DAB at night that can't attend here during the day. So why shouldn't we have that information? The, They're the same the, people that would come here and speak. The, the, the council, the district advisory board is, is, has been created for the benefit of the council, this, the council member, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the council member. But and and and, it, and then they can use that information. I understand public, all that, right? Okay, but, but, but so we, we can but, still we use it. Why do we need to? Because they can't come here and speak during the day. They they can go there at night if that's what we're saying. Yeah. How do we make decisions but, without their feedback if they if they don't can't come here? And and we're not going to remote uh, discussion then I think it's all the more important that we have the DAB input before we vote. I'm sorry, I'm not going to change my mind. Uh, 
You're talking about a system that was set up years before we even had the virtual situation tales, and it seemed to work then. I know. And, and all of a sudden, them you know, I, I'm kind of like Mike said a while ago, you know, if it's important enough for them to be here, I'm sure they can't get off work to do it, but there is the DAB meeting, and I don't know any city council person that doesn't read and know what's going on in the DAB before they make a vote. Do you? And you're pretty strong with it about the dabs. You and I have argued a nudge about that, so. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so. Scott, I've got a question. Does the city council allow council members or people from the public to communicate remotely in their meetings? Well, there, um, council members uh, can participate virtually. I wouldn't say that it's a it's a common occurrence, but it does occur. Um, it just recently occurred, I think probably one or two meetings ago even. It, oh, and Joe's pointing out that, the, yes, it's true, and county commission does that as well. Um, and they ha had that happen at the last uh, well, meeting. The, um, that's true, uh, Philip just pointed out as well that the district advisory boards often do have a virtual component as well. Um, I think there was another part to your question. I'm sorry. I've, I've, so, no, that was it. Oh, so, yes. Th I'm sorry. That was the second part, uh, Mr. Aldrich. Just reminded me. It was uh, so the the members get to participate. Now, in terms of the public participation, uh, neither the city council nor the county commission accept uh, public participation virtually. The DABs do, and I'm not familiar enough with the CABs to know if they do. Um, it's been a while. I think it depends on the depends cab. On. Yeah. Bob, I got a question for Scott. Now, I kind of agree with with Joe on having the dab before the planning commission. What would have to happen for that to happen? Sure, and, and thank you. It for, has to do with the schedule. I know. Uh, but exactly. Is there a way to fix it? Thank you for asking that question um, and the way that you've asked it because. It's something that I believe could be done. It's just that there's a trade-off, and that trade-off would be the time from receipt of the application or submission of the application to the time that the governing body would make a decision on it. And Philip is well versed on this one because he often has to make presentations not from this perspective, but from the flip side, which is that the DABs want to know why they're either not hearing it first or hearing it second. And why is it always flip flop? So I'll turn to Philip. And actually, I have a presentation on this. We just don't have it loaded on the computer because <laughs> we we I, we presented to a dev who had a very similar question. Uh, in general, if the dev were to have to hear the presentation first before it came to planning commission, that particular cycle, so it'd be having to do, for example, in September. It'd be having dabs here, cases this week for the September 28th meeting. We would have one week to complete those staff reports, review them, and send them off to the dab or cab for them to have their meeting versus the cycle we're on now at the first planning commission of the month that had dab before it. We have three weeks to review write and submit those to the DAB and CAB. So we're talking kind of fairness and equity in terms of staff resources, staff time. You all know how exhaustive our agendas have been. Um, and so if we give some cases three weeks of time to review and write, and then other cases one week of time to review and write, that kind of boils but down you to could, But you could, change, you could change that to where you had more time, it would just, it would just slow down the process for somebody filing. Which well, then, then it becomes a, a burden for the developer, whoever's trying to, to get the case presented and, and heard. If they wind up, instead of having a month or whatever the, the standard length of time, it could be a month, six weeks, two months for a developer to be able to get anything accomplished because I, of a schedule. All right. What is the expectation right now for an application to say is all complete? 30 days, 60 great, days? Great question. It's uh, it's 90 days for a zoning application. And as Philip indicated, um, and, and I think Mr. Hartman was getting to, so for the timing of some, you would have one week to prepare it, or you could delay it and take it to the next month's DAB, which would add an additional, what, four weeks onto it or three weeks onto it? 
Or I, you could just you know, leave virtual might, meetings and the DAB people that go to the DAB could just come, just could speak here. Well, the thing about the DABs, you know, I like to remind everybody they're strictly a district advisory board that doesn't have as much teeth, if you will, as the planning commission and the city council. You know, they were established just like uh, Mike said earlier, you know, for the purpose to uh, advise the city council members on the feedback and from what their neighbor, uh, their district and everything else is doing, you know, and it's nice to have that, that input, but they're not binding. And, and I think that, uh, it doesn't happen too often where the DAB hears it after the fact. They really try to get it to the DABs prior, but you know, you one might think that one time and it's it's you know the system's broke, but it's not. It's been going on like this for years and years and years, well before the DABs were even established, um, and it seems to work fairly fairly well, uh, you know. But you know, again, I think I think there's at times there's too much creed put into uh, the dabs and I'm not trying to take anybody's voice away, but they still have that opportunity, you know, uh, to make their voices heard to the city council representatives and even the county commissioners. I think there's pluses and minuses to modern technology and people still have the ability to either write a letter or send an email in to get their voices heard. Um, I'd like a legal opinion if I can. Does not the state statute that establishes planning commissions basically require us to hear the public? And I realize that it's all a matter of degree, but if the principle is that we should be listening to the public as part of the process of making our decisions, I think we should try and make it as easy for the public to talk to us as possible. Is that not correct? Kirk Sponsel, Deputy County Counselor. Uh, statutorily, it just indicates public hearing. So that implies the opportunity for people to uh, participate. And so I think requiring them to be here in person, that would satisfy a public hearing just as much as allowing them to show up remotely as well would. All right, thank you. I just, I think, I don't think we should be depending on DAB to do our work for us. I, I appreciate the input we get from them, but I think we still need to have our own independent capacity to have the public speak to us. One of the things is DAB has their own schedule and their own program that's separate from all the rest of the operation in the city as far as planning is concerned. Our subdivision has a schedule, we have a schedule, all, everything else, the, the developers have a schedule. Everybody's got a, a planned schedule. DAB doesn't have it. They say we want to meet once a week or once a month, isn't it? Once a month. So the only way I think we can get any coordination is to say, yeah, you meet twice a month, alternate something. They just get on the same same token as all the rest of us. And that, I think that solved the whole problem. But the thing is that if we're saying that people can go and speak up on a planning case at the DAB, meeting but we're not getting that feedback from those individuals because the trade-off is they can either go to a, a dab meeting in the evening or they can take off work if they're able to take off work and come here and listen and give their input if if we're not hearing that input one way or another if we're restricting input or the ability to provide input it's it's not my i mean i'm certainly i'm concerned about hearing from the dab and the dab meetings occurring after we hear cases, but we're also not going to hear from that individual because we're not going to, we're, we're, we've already heard the case. Yeah, but you're not restricting their ability to come. The notification is being put out based on statutes and everything else, whether it's to the DABs or anybody else that wants to hear that case. So you're not restricting that, their ability to come to speak. It's up to them you know, to be able to come here uh, to this this uh, venue here to be heard. If they can't make that for whatever reason, it's not this commission's responsibility 
you know, to make sure that we stop everything just so they can come to hear the case because there are avenues and channels and everything else out there to get that information to them. I do believe that employment opportunities really do restrict people from being here. Um, and I have a really hard time saying we would give the commissioners a different purview than we would give the public. So if we're requiring ourselves to be present and the public to be present, right. that's one thing. I wouldn't want to see a two-way system yeah. um, for convenience. Well, and the nice thing is the public still has the district advisory board meeting that they can go and, and talk. And, and cases, planning cases, I believe they go to the district advisory board uh, and present cases and they get their they get public feedback there. What I appreciate about the public comment happening in this venue is that, that we have the opportunity to hear the developer response to the public concern. And sometimes I think that allows us to make sure that the developer is hearing it where we don't require the developer or the applicant, I should say, to be at the dabs where the public has the opportunity to hear that response or we hear uh, the response of the developer. Phil, they have the option to do that if they want to, though. Went, Joe, excuse me, go ahead. I want to throw out something totally extraneous. But you look at the average age of MAPC, then you look at the average age of the dabs, and I think you'll find a big disparity of the type of people that actually get to hear and, and give input. I mean, we don't have anybody on this. Careful. I'm not going to offend him. <laughs> Are you calling us old? Back that bus up, buddy. I'm not going to. No one's uh, under 50 on, on board. But you know what I'm saying? That's a whole different voice to be heard. We've got a lot of diverse, uh, uh, I think, opinions on this. Um, we have a substitute motion on the floor. Uh, first of all, Scott, what uh, response are you looking for on this? Do you want to vote on what we're going to do, or do you want us to accept this and review it further? Well, I think I think the uh, I think the indication that we got at the the prior MAPC discussion about this topic was just that it, the situation was frustrating, and that they wanted to ha that there was a desire to have a conversation about it and possibly um, change the way that the the participation options were what was available um, and from my own preference I look to you all um, in terms of what uh, what formats uh, you want to offer and you want to have available um, I, I just want to assure you that from staff's perspective we will work to provide whatever format you want to have um, and I think that you've seen that we work diligently to do that so uh, whatever direction or indication you want to provide Okay, well, we have a motion and a substitute motion on the floor. I would like to call the question on the uh, substitute motion. Could you please restate that? My substitute motion was to continue to allow everyone that wants to participate to participate virtually. Is there a second to that motion? I you second, second it. it. Any further discussion? If not, let's vote on the substitute motion. Uh, I think maybe it'd be good to take a roll call uh, vote on this. Yes, sir. Uh, Fox. I am in favor of the substitute motion. Duel. No. McKay. No. Green. No. Bill Johnson. No. Josh Blick is absent. Nix is absent. Foster? Yes. Warren is absent. Joe Johnson? No. Miles? Yes. Hartman? No. Aldridge? No. Williams Bay? Yes. I have the vote as four to seven. I think we should have given our ages to you when we voted, just to see. I never really finished my point. Okay, uh, I'm back to the issue. No, wait a minute. We Business. have a, pardon? Businesses won't, it's very hard for businesses to let a young person serve on the MAPC, whereas they can serve on the DABs. 
for what that's worth. Are you suggesting that we go to evening meetings? Evening meetings? No. <laughs> Going back to the age he was talking about a while ago, we'd all be asleep in about 15 or 20 minutes. City Commission used to meet at night. Okay, Mr. Green made a motion. Would you like to restate that, please? Uh, uh, return to in-person meetings only unless and until another lockdown is mandated, which would require returning to declaring an emergency to have virtual meetings. And I believe we have a second. 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 And before you vote, I, I just please, if I could, a staff comment on this one. Um, and please be aware that we have advertised, we advertise for meetings at least 20 days prior to the meeting. So there are meetings that are scheduled for in the future that already have the virtual component included. So, um, and the second part is that, um, you know, this, this does not, would not change the bylaws. Um, virtual would still be an opportunity, but I think this is an indication to the chairperson and among you all about how you prefer to have your meeting formats. You can, can staff no. make a recommendation that this will go into effect like, like in October or November to cover that? Well, we would we would work um, with the chair, coordinate with the chair to do it as soon as uh, the next, whenever the next available meeting session would be. Now, I'm looking to legal, uh, to Kirk, you look like he was going to say something just in case. Uh, Kirk Sponsel, Deputy County Counselor. Uh, I was just going to say what... Uh, Commissioner Aldrich was uh, just the possibility of potentially uh, doing a delayed effect date, but that was all I was going to comment on. And I have a question. You indicated specifically lockdown, which I assume you mean related to health conditions, but I would think that um, inclement weather, like serious inclement weather, might be another consideration, or you want to keep it only to health considerations? Uh, that's starting to get a little complicated there. I think the only reason why we went to virtual in the first place was because we uh, had a had a situation with COVID and uh, we had to declare an emergency to even be able to do this virtually to begin with. So I'm just, that's why I stated it the way I did. Scott, did I understand you correctly that you said we st could still uh, consider in the future virtual meetings if we needed to? Um, that would be up to your, uh, that would be up to the MAPC. We would look to you, the chairperson, be the indicator, the leader on that, it, on when and where that is appropriate. Uh, because there is nothing binding on this vote. This is an advisory. It's not part of your bylaws. So, but I think it's an so important. So that could be changed at any time. I mean, it, it could, yes. A month from now, I could go back to the other way if you don't like it. Yeah, it's exactly right. Um, but I think it's an, I don't mean to diminish this vote. I just want to uh, manage expectations in terms of what, what it is, so. And does this include telephone as well as video? That is the way that I'm interpreting it. Um, if, if we, because that is the only way that we offer the telephone option is through the virtual meeting. We'll still, oh. video. We'll still be videoing and broadcasting on uh, the, the meetings. So that people will still have an opportunity to see the meeting. And that so, is. So, Mike, with your motion, would you would you be agreeable to for this to go into effect? We have a motion. We have a second on it, right? Yeah. Would you say, Bob? Would you be willing to change your motion so that this goes into effect, so, so it won't affect the, the, the notices that go out in the future? And oh well, it, it, we. We're, we're bound by that at this point because those notices have already been sent. So whenever it gets to the point where those notices, we, we, you cease and desist with the notices that, that allow for virtual meetings now, but we're still going to have virtual meetings for probably another month. You could possibly do it like Okay, we've got a motion and a second. I think we'll take pardon. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. McKay. Uh, well, I'm just talking to staff. Uh, we could say date certain, like for example, first meeting in November or something to that effect. Because uh, staff's probably going to make it happen as soon as possible. Which That's is right. what we, they've we, indicated. We, so we, we yeah. would aim for the the next agenda that would go out to remove the virtual uh, announcement. And did we decide we talked earlier that this applies to uh, advanced plans and subdivisions as well as this commission? 
that discussion has not happened uh, here at this MAPC meeting. Um, that would be a, another question for you all um, in talking with staff, just for consistency's sake and for reduction of uh, confusion, we would aim to keep it consistent unless we heard otherwise from, from you all. Because what we would hate to have is someone dials in for subdivision and then thinks that they have the same opportunity to, at MAPC and then finds out later that they don't. And um, it causes a delay in the case that needs to be deferred or, or whatever the circumstances may be. So for consistency's sake, uh, staff would staff would be prepared to proceed with whatever your decision is also for the subdivision and advanced plans meetings. Well, yeah, and, and I specifically didn't identify planning commission only. I, you know, in-person meetings. Can I make general, another substitute so that, motion? That would include no. all. Mr. Chair, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to leave. Can we call the vote, please? Mr. Chair, can yes. I make a substitute Let's motion? Let's do call the vote. Well, we, can we call the vote, please? I did. I just called the vote. I think we need okay, to have a voice call. vote on this. Yes, sir. Uh, this is on the uh, first on the motion, principal motion. Fox? No. Dual thought about this a lot, and I guess since I have the power of the gavel, I am going to vote yes on this. McKay? Yes. Green? Yes. Bill Johnson? Yes. Josh Blick is absent. Hugh Nix is absent. Foster? No. Warren is absent. Joe Johnson? No. Miles? No. Hartman? Yes. Aldrich? Yes. Williams Bay. No. Six to five. Yes, it passes six to five. I protest that I get I didn't get to use the substitute motion. The motion that was called was called prior to your request for a substitute motion. So that it has to be heard first. And Mr. John what I would offer as well is that you can talk with the chairperson if you wish to get another item on to discuss this issue. What I was thinking, I, I was going to just have a motion to allow what the county and city does, that the, that the members of the, of the um, planning commission are, could, could do it remotely. So, I lost out. Well, I think we're done for the day. Uh, thank you for your participation.